Hello. So we're going to look at price controls. This is the last part of chapter six, uh, section one. And so you're going to be able to identify the direct and the indirect effects of uh, price floors and ceilings. So this is what the normal market looks like. And when it's in a state of equilibrium, okay, remember if it's out of equilibrium, it's got two states it can be in. If it's above the equilibrium price, that is called um, a surplus. And if it's below the equilibrium price, that is called shortage. Both are bad things and they have different effects. But remember, we want to try to make maintain equilibrium because this is the point at which uh, we have maximum buyer and seller participation. So sometimes for lots of different reasons, the government, whether that be local, state or federal, can get involved in the market. And what they do is they can't really change demand and they can't really uh, change supply per se. But what they can do is they can set what are called price controls. And one kind of price control is what's called a price ceiling. OK, a price ceiling is just it's a price that you cannot go over. OK, you're not legally allowed to go over it. So what it does, depending on where it falls, OK, um, if it's below the equilibrium, it's going to create an artificial shortage. OK, it is possible that you the government sets the price ceiling above the equilibrium, which means that it's not actually going to affect the market itself. But remember, you guys, this is chapter six, and we've been talking about how there are things that cause the supply and demand curves to shift sometimes both at the same time. And so just because the price ceiling is above the equilibrium right now uh, in the future, that could change. OK, so a shortage is, is never a good thing because this is what you know people are supplying at that price. And this is what people are demanding at that price. And so what you would do is you would look at like how many are people demanding? How many are people supplying? You would subtract the two and that's your shortage. Now, in a natural market, not one that's price controlled, the supply would increase and then the demand would meet it. And that's all based on, you know, the price. OK, boom. But the price is set here by the government. And so this creates an artificial shortage. Sellers may not make more of the product. Why would you make this much of the product when all you can do is sell it at that price? Anything that you um, make and sell beyond that, you would be selling at a loss and they don't want to do that. OK. A price floor is the minimum that you're allowed uh, to sell something for. So you can't go um, below that price. And again, if it, it's, it's going to be above the equilibrium price, this is going to create a surplus. If it's below, well, then it's it's not effective. And again, the, the equilibrium price can shift. It can go all over the place. So ceilings, if it's below the equilibrium price, creates a shortage. Oops. If it's um, a price floor and it's above the surplus, it creates, uh, I'm sorry, above the equilibrium price, it creates a surplus, right? So one of the things to keep in mind about the ceiling and the floor is where is it located, okay? If it's the ceiling and it's above the equilibrium price, it's, it's ineffective. If it's the floor and it's below the equilibrium price, it's ineffective. So they're mirrors of each other, okay? Why would the government do this? Well, we'll get into it. But so in a normal market condition, I mean, really, the government in the United States doesn't get involved directly um, in price setting of that many things. I mean, we are a market driven economy and, you know, it doesn't like you can't be a market driven economy and have the government setting the prices. That's socialism. So but there are instances in which the government does get involved. And it's typically what they're doing is, is they're trying to make a, a good um, cheaper for consumers to buy. And this could be medicine, and this could be um, homes to rent or apartments to rent. It could be healthy foods. I mean, there, there's a list of, of different things it could be, but price controls are what we're looking at. The thing about the government's involvement is that it has unintended consequences. So um, price controls, what it definitely does is it brings about less exchange than would um, exist without them, okay? Um, so if you think about this real quick, if you look at the price floor, the seller is, you know, definitely involved. They are this far ahead or beyond the equilibrium. They're definitely involved. However, 
the demanders are here, which means they never quite reach the um, equilibrium. So this is where it really cuts off. So they're not as involved in this market exchange and the supply is in excess of it. And then if you look at the ceiling, it's the same idea. You've got the suppliers are only able to go to this point. They're never able to make it to this point. Okay. Where the demand side goes all the way down here, exceeding the um, equilibrium price. And so you've got way more people who want to be able to be involved, but can't be. And this is all caused by the price controls themselves. These are these artificial things that are impeding um, the exchange. Okay. Now, in a normal market, as we said, buyers and sellers are participating right here at equilibrium. Okay. This means that at as it stands, the demand and the supply are at their peak in efficiency. Okay. People who want to buy it, people who are selling it, are meeting each other, and everything's great. Okay. I want you to keep that in mind as I go through this like scenario here. So let's assume that you have something and you want to sell that that thing for 10 bucks. And so you put it on eBay and a person looks at it and they offer to pay you $8 instead of the $10. So that means you're going to get $2 less than you asked for. Now you have to make the decision. Do you sell it for the $8 um, because that $8 is more important to you than that item or do you keep it? And at the same time, the person that's buying this for eight bucks, they're making the decision that that item that they're going to buy from you is worth more than the eight dollars that they have in their pocket. OK, now in this whole scenario, the regular market scenario, you are deciding and the other person is deciding. So we have participation, we have choice, and we have exchange. Now, you might decide, nope, I don't want to sell this thing for eight bucks. I want ten dollars. And so you hold on to it. You're happy. They're not happy. But at the same time, if they come up with the other two dollars, they can buy it from you. Or they can decide it's not worth the $10. It's only worth $8 in the leave. Okay. Again, people are participating. They are making the choice and they are making the exchange. Let's assume though that this is a price control situation. You want to sell it for $10, but the government says you have to sell it for $8. Okay. There's going to be fewer people that are participating because, you know, some people will be like, this is worth $10 and I'm being made to sell it for eight. I'm not going to make these products. I'll switch to something else that's not price controlled. Okay. So we also have less choice because if there are fewer people, um, by people, I mean, sellers involved, uh, that means that there's, there's less choice. And then there's just less exchange because as people are pulling out of the market, all of these things are decreasing. Okay. There are reasons and some of them are good reasons for the government to get involved in price controls. I mean, what they're trying to do is solve a problem, not create a problem. The issue, though, is the unintended consequences create problems. OK. So we have to look at the reality, which is that if price controls decrease the amount of exchange that occurs and they do, then we should assume that price controls limit the opportunities that people have to make themselves better off. OK. Opportunity is a big thing. Opportunity, choice, participation, all that stuff. Now, historically, the United States government has really not really been that involved when it comes to price controls. If you look at like 1776 to essentially 1900, we were pretty much a laissez-faire um, type of oversight when it came to the economy. But after the stock markets collapsed in 1929, it triggered the events that lead to the Great Depression, um, in the 1930s, and then specifically with the election of um, FDR and his New Deal policies, um, we see the government begin to become involved with price controls. And so that could be anything from the minimum wage to uh, certain products that, that, that farmers produce having um, a set price that's associated with them. But price controls aren't just a government thing either. Like unions do this too. Like unions will set the rate at which um, you can do a job. So if you're a unionized plumber and the, the unionized rate is, I don't know, say $30 per hour, then when you contract out to work for other people, they can't pay you less than $30. They can pay you more, but they can't pay you less. Okay. And so this creates either 
surpluses or shortages. And in the case of unions, um, they create shortages of workers. And this is done intentionally so that wages can, um, can be inflated or go up, okay? So there's another time though, besides the government and uh, unions in which uh, there will be price controls. And this is like local, state, or federal government, again, will impose price controls if there's been like some sort of natural disaster. And what they do is they target specific items and they'll say that these items are, are deemed as necessary and they will not allow price gouging. So like bottled water, which is, you know, a, a case of 24, which is normally like say six bucks, you can't sell it for $60. Um, same thing with electric generators or um, gasoline. Now, it's hard to actually enforce these price controls, but they are there and you can report people if they are um, gouging you for prices. The problem is, is of course, like you can buy, like it's, there's a pandemic, right? So a bunch of people went out and they bought um, all of the, the Lysol products that they could find. And then they resold them on uh, like Amazon. And so they're making money, but like the rest of us that are going to like Meyer or Kroger or wherever, you can't find Lysol. So is there a disruption to the service? Yes, there's a shortage. What's happening to price? It's increased. Is it really supposed to be there? No, but the th just like I've talked to you guys about many times, laws are one thing, but enforcement is the key. And if you can't enforce the, the law, then the law itself is, is um, ineffective. So that is price controls, okay? There's this video I want you to watch that talks about price controls. And then that's it for chapter uh, six, section one. And then I would like you to complete the student work. It's on Google Classroom. Make sure you turn it in after you finished it. And then there's a chapter six, section one quiz that I would like you to do as well. Okay, thank you.